Star Wars canon explains the formation of the New Testament canon. Why? Well, consider the similarities. Both the Star Wars franchise and early Christianity have an authoritative creator figure, authoritative authors, the apostles in Christianity on one hand, Timothy Zahn, Dave Filoni, and Pablo Hidalgo on the other side, and both feature arguments over what should be considered canon and what shouldn't, and powerful institutions that try to systematize canon lists. Looking at the Star Wars universe, we can catch a glimpse of what's at stake when forming a canon, and how messy the process of canonization can be as competing groups attempt to solidify the canon. So before we dive in, let's first define our terms. Canon refers to a collection of works or texts that are considered to be authoritative or genuine. Whenever we use this term in early Christian studies, we are typically referring to the biblical canon or the New Testament canon, the collection of texts that early Christian authorities saw as the only authoritative texts. No more no less. Through a messy process in the early centuries of Christianity, different Christian groups settled on these 27 books as the New Testament. But we also see canon formation in the Star Wars fandom. The events of Star Wars occurred a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Therefore, we can view all Star Wars source material as historical documents that we can use to piece together the true authoritative Star Wars saga. Before Disney bought Star Wars in 2012, you had a world of novels, comic books and video games that pick up where the Return of the Jedi ended. Han and Leia marry and have three kids, Luke Skywalker falls in love with an Imperial assassin Mara Jade, and the galaxy is eventually invaded by the weird extra-galactic species the Yuuzhan Vong. As far as I was concerned as a young Star Wars fan, this was the Star Wars saga. I learned to love new non-canonical characters like Mara Jade just as much as I loved the canonical characters. I learned to feel feared new villains like Grand Admiral Thrawn just as much as I feared Darth Vader. But many Star Wars fans didn't even know about these novels or even care, and some purists thought it was basically fan fiction. They only accepted the movies by the creator himself, George Lucas, to be authoritative. In an attempt to clear things up, Lucasfilm employees tried to agree upon a canon, instituting a hierarchy of sources from the most authoritative to the least authoritative. The six movies constituted the G canon, the George Lucas canon, the most authoritative sources that take priority over all other material. The television canon, or the T canon, was equal or at least one step below in credibility, having been heavily influenced by George Lucas himself and his disciple Dave Filoni. And finally, there was the C canon, which was an apocryphal collection of novels, video games, and comic books that may or may not describe the true Star Wars saga. Bits and pieces of the C canon started to trickle into Star Wars even before the Disney buyout. When Disney stepped in, they swept away the sea canon and instituted a new canon comprised of the movies, the TV shows, and all future material produced by Disney. And to this day, the Star Wars canon continues to grow. Lucasfilm employees like Pablo Hidalgo even create canon on an almost weekly basis on YouTube and Twitter. So here we see similarities to early Christianity, a hierarchy of sources, governing authority, Authorities that try to institute a true canon, and instability in the canon as new texts are published and garner huge fan bases despite their controversy. Like the Lucasfilm storyboard meetings, early Christian authorities formed councils to try to hash out the true canon, to try to create a hierarchy of authoritative texts. The Four Gospels? Well, according to early Christian authorities, they had the right pedigree and the right antiquity to be considered authoritative. But other popular texts, like the Shepherd of Hermas, just didn't make it. Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, published our earliest evidence of the 27-book canon that we see today. His 39th and 40th Festal Letters, published in the 4th century CE, include a canon list. But let's be careful here. Athanasius was responding to a marketplace that he could not fully control. The scholar of early Christianity, David Brackey, argues that debates over the biblical canon were not merely about making lists of books, but these debates reflected fundamental conflicts between competing Christian social groups. Using ancient Christian Egypt as an example, David Brackey illustrates how Athanasius was competing against other academic Christian circles, schools of disciples that were founded around a famous philosopher or theologian, and some of these philosophers and theologians were not so concerned about sticking to the canonical texts. 
They wrote their own Gospels, they wrote their own Acts of the Apostles that became very popular. And it's in this mess of competing Christian authorities that Athanasius published his canon, not as an edict that all the Christians would just follow without questioning, but in the words of David Brackey, as one step in an ongoing conflict among authoritative persons and social institutions that surrounded them. Now, Athanasius did eventually win. After all, if you go to the bookstore and pull off a New Testament, you'll see 27 books, but this was not a guarantee at the time. Other Christian compilations that came from the same time and region as Athanasius, like the Codex Sinaiticus, places non-canonical books like the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas alongside canonical books, suggesting Athanasius was one voice out of many. At the very least, the Star Wars fandom helps us empathize with these early Christians. We can see what's at stake when you form a canon list. If you are an only the original trilogy purist, you might empathize with the four gospel only purists who rejected popular books at the time like the Gospel of Peter or the Gospel of Thomas. If you're upset that Mara Jade will probably never be canonized, then maybe you can empathize with St. Thecla fans who are ticked off that her story never made it into the New Testament. Or maybe you're asking, who has the authority to canonize anyway? Should we listen to Pablo Hidalgo, a modern day Athanasius who's been vested with the power to canonize by a huge institution? Or can we strike off on our own and accept whatever sources we want? Create our own headcanon that deviates from the so-called authoritative saga? Even though we're separated by these people by 1500 years, debates over canons today can help illustrate why canonization is such a messy process, and why that process can sometimes drudge up such visceral emotions. As always, thanks for watching.